Um, well, good morning. Um, we really truly just want to welcome you to the River Church. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. My name is Rachel Johnson, and I am part of the host team here at the River Church, and I have just a couple of announcements for you. For the last couple of weeks, you may have heard about the birthday blessing boxes that our River Kids are putting together. And if you are unfamiliar with what that is, um, the kids have a desire to put together boxes that will be distributed to the food pantry. And um, inside of those boxes would be all of the things that you would use to maybe make a cake or have small gifts in. And that way parents who are visiting the food pantry and have a birthday coming up in their house are able to pick up one of those as well. Um, they are going to be assembling those boxes next week. So next week is the last week that they are going to be accepting donations. So if you're interested in that, please bring those with you next Sunday. Also, immediately following the service, everyone who is signed up to help with one of the transition projects as we prepare to head over to the community park building in Delavan, we will have a brief meeting following the service. And Pastor Zach is just going to lead us through what that process looks like. We promise to keep it brief. Um, you'll be able to sign up for your first meeting in the group that you're going to be a part of, and we'll have you be on your way. So if you haven't signed up yet, just stick around after the, after the service and you'll be able to hear a little bit more detail about what all of that is going to look like. Also, um, in your cup holder, you will find a connection card. This is just a great way for us to get to know you. So if you are new, this is your first Sunday, we welcome you, we truly do care about you and we want to know what's going on in your life. But we want you to communicate with us in a way that you're comfortable with. And the connection card is one way for you to do that. You can fill it out during the service and you'll have an opportunity to drop it in the offering basket later on in the service. And now we welcome Pastor Zach. Ooh. There's some like weird sound in the system. Can we like just cut everything except for me? Is that possible? It's just that hus. There it is. You found it. Ed, you're the, the, the hero of the day. Ed Day. I thought they were going to clap for you there, but um, <laughs> whoops. Uh, that was embarrassing for me, I guess, or maybe you. I'm not sure. Um, good morning, church. Ooh, now I'm real boomy. Um, it's good to see you all this morning. My name is Zach, the lead pastor here at the River Church. Um, it's, a bit, it's like super heavy over here. Hey, guys, I'm like, forget you guys today. I'm going to pay attention over here. Um, this morning, we're going to continue in our, uh, in our series called Stories, where we're focusing on the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 9 this morning. Um, just as a reminder, as we journey through the book of Luke in the first half of this year, I would love for anyone and everyone to jump on board with our Luke reading challenge as we read through the Gospel of Luke each week, either via our email that goes out weekly um, sometime in the back end of the week, or via Facebook. We put um, that picture out, and it looks like that, and usually it comes with some sort of question, and we like to interact with you in some way. Um, so this week, we're focusing on chapter 11 and chapter 10 in the book of Luke. Um, before we jump into the text, though, I want to provide some context as to where we are in Luke, so you understand where we're going in Luke, uh, because as you'll hear today in Luke chapter 11, or chapter 9, we kind of hit like a pivot moment in Luke's gospel, where um, the Luke's focus changes. Jesus' focus changes. Um, because you'll hear today, we start this journey to the cross where Jesus in chapter 9 makes it very clear that he is physically orienting himself toward Jerusalem, toward the cross. From chapter 1 all the way through chapter 9, verse 50, Luke has told us who Jesus is. He has answered the question, who is this man called the Son of God? Who is this man who has come to bring the kingdom of God to earth? Chapter 1, chapter 2, we get the birth narrative. We're told about his baptism, where he's given this identity from the voice, from the heavens, from the voice of God, saying, this is my son whom I, well, whom I, who I am well pleased. We're told that Jesus has come to bring good news to those who are unhealthy, unrighteous, poor, weak, and unworthy. We're told that he's come to challenge the status quo, the social and religious hierarchies of the day. He says, woe to you, those of you who are rich and powerful. 
We see him engaging in ministry of healing people, the sick, the blind, the dead. His hands are the very tools of ministry. And we see him engaging with people who are sinful, people who are broken. He's eating and staying with the social outcasts of the day. And subsequently, he's being called out because of his actions, because of what he's doing. He's being told that he's not exactly the man who he says he is. And that all happens in the first nine chapters of Luke's gospel to help us answer the question, who is this man? Who is Jesus? Which is the very question that Jesus himself asks his disciples in chapter 9, verse 18. He says, who am I? Based on the information that you have, who do you say that I am? This is what it says, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, the one of the ancient prophets has arisen. Jesus, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Messiah of God. Peter, in this moment, says, Jesus, I think that you are the one that the scriptures have been promising us is going to come. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the Most High, Jesus. You are the one who the Scripture is pointing toward. You are the one who the prophets foretold us about, who would come and save us and bring us out of the mess in this world. He's saying, you are the Messiah. And Luke, in his detailed storytelling ways, spent nine chapters setting us up for this very moment in chapter 9. Who is Jesus? Who is this man? Peter says he's the Messiah. Peter says he's the anointed one, the promised one who has come to reconcile us back to God and save us from our sin. And with that, with that, just Luke shifts his storytelling method. Luke has told his reader who Jesus is and what he's come to do. He's, he's shared with us how Jesus is, is planning to bring others into the story with him. But with Peter's proclamation of Jesus as Messiah, Luke changes the question from who is Jesus to what has Jesus come to accomplish? If his identity as Savior, if his identity as the Messiah, if his identity as the Anointed One, the Chosen One, the Son of God, what is, is he going to accomplish now? And as the story pivots, we're going to see Jesus begin to direct his attention to how he is going to reconcile, how he is going to save. And in this chapter, we begin the journey of how he's going to save, how he's going to save the poor, how he's going to save the unrighteous, how is he going to save the unworthy. We see Jesus physically turn himself to the cross. In chapter 9, for the first time in Luke's gospel, we hear Jesus is fully expecting to die. So in the first nine chapters, the question is, who is Jesus? Who is this man? And Luke turns his attention to answering now, how will he save? And in chapter 9, we have this divine pivot point in the story. In order to save, he must be captured. In order to give life, he has to endure death. In verse 22, he says this to his disciples, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And again, in verse 44, he tells them, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. So to carry out the salvation, the work of salvation for all, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, in order to save, he must be captured. In order to give life, he must experience death. So as Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God, and now that we know who Jesus is, Luke turns our attention to what Jesus is going to accomplish, what Jesus is going to endure on the cross. And that is where we're going to find ourselves at the back in the last 11 or so verses of Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Think about that, that quick phrase, he set his face, because it's, it happens twice here, and it's important for us, and we're going to come back to it. A couple things you have to see here that, that he's expecting, Luke is telling us that he's going to be taken up meaning he is going to die, he's going to be resurrected, and he's going to be ascended, ascending into heaven. So Luke is already foretelling what is to come here. He's, he's referring to what is, is going to happen on the back end of the story. And here we see that, that Jesus has, has set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
Now this is like he's physically like turning his body and he's moving toward the capital city of Israel. So we understand now he's moving his, himself toward Jerusalem. Verse 52. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heavens and consume them? But he turned and he rebuked them. Then they went to another village. There are two things that I want to pull out of this phrase that he set his face toward Jerusalem. Number one, um, this tells us from, from this point on until verse, or chapter 19 in Luke's Gospel, you should assume that all of the stories that will be told between chapter 9 and chapter 19 are all going to be on the road toward Jerusalem. That, that this is now a, a journey story, that Luke is following the path with Jesus. They're on their way, and this is not a, a, weird, a weird journey for them to make. Like, they would make this pilgrimage every single year in the spring to experience Passover festival. So all the Jews from all over the, the, the region would come to Jerusalem. So, so as people are hearing this, as, as Jesus is saying, we have to go to Jerusalem, they're not thinking, like, this is a strange thought. This is, not a, this is a strange journey that he's taking us on. No, they do this every single year. So this is something that they are, they are oriented toward. They're like, yeah, it's time to go to Jerusalem. That makes sense to us. So being in the, in the, region, from the region of Galilee the northern region of Israel. Every year they'd travel south, but they'd go kind of around Samaritan, or the Samaria, and we'll talk about the Samaritans uh, uh, next week or the week after. Um, and they, they'd avoid it because the Samaritans weren't that friendly to Israelites, so they'd want to go around it, but eventually they'd go south where they'd celebrate Passover. And Passover is this big festival for the Jews that they'd celebrate in remembrance of what God did for them in Egypt. As a spirit of God, this is like Prince of Egypt, if you've seen this, or if you've read Exodus chapter 12. Um, as a spirit of God would pass over the house of the Israelites with lamb's blood over the, the, the door, the, the spirit of God would pass over them. We read about this in Exodus, and we'll just read a short excerpt of this. Verse 12. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animal, and I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood over the, their doors will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see that blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as the festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So every single year, you have to understand this. When Jesus says, I'm going to turn my face toward Jerusalem, every single year, the disciples, his, the people who were following him at this point in time, they were like, yeah, it's festival, it's Passover time. This is what we're going to celebrate every single year, just like it says in Exodus. For generations you shall come to celebrate the Passover of the Lord. This is a normal occurrence for them. So the first thing that we have to note about when Jesus says, I'm going to turn my face toward Jerusalem, is that he's physically turning his body toward Jerusalem just as he had always done, had done. But he's all, there's also a second meaning in this, because we all know the story, but there's a second meaning in this. Jesus is not only moving toward Jerusalem to take part in the Passover festival. Jesus, in his full knowledge, knew exactly what he was doing. He was going to Jerusalem to fulfill the mission of God, the mission of salvation for all people. Jesus had taken this trip every single year of his life, but he knows that this is the last one that he will take with his friends. It seems like he knows what's coming. He knows that every animal that he has ever seen sacrificed and the blood that was shed as a sacrifice for the foreshadowing of what was to come in a matter of weeks, he knows that every single animal that has ever been sacrificed, he knows that in a couple weeks on the cross, it will be him in their place the ultimate atonement, the ultimate sacrifice for sins. When Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem, I don't think that there's a single question in Jesus' heart or mind what, that he didn't know that, what he was doing here. 
His face is set on the cross. He came to proclaim the good news of the poor, to release the captives, to bring healing to those who are sick. And as he turns his face to Jerusalem, he has come to end on the cross. He came to live among us that he might die for us. So on, from this point on, everything that we read, Jesus is clearly moving toward the cross. Church, this is the heart of our God. In Jesus, we find a God who is willing to give it all up for us, willing to pursue the cross, willing to pursue sacrifice and excruciating death and persecution for us. Even though we constantly turn our faces away from God, God turns his face toward the cross for us. In fact, the Son, the Son of God in His great love for us turns His face toward the cross, turns His faith toward death so that we might experience life. So as you hear this, as you read in chapter 9, when He turns His face toward Jerusalem, not only is He turning His face toward the city, but He's turning His face toward the cross. So when you read this phrase, really He's turning His face toward us, right? He's turning His face toward his children, laying down his life for us, laying down his priorities for us. And this is really a, like a pivotal moment for us to understand that the God that we, we talk about here is not a God who's sitting on high barking down orders, not saying, submit your life to me, and if you don't, I'll rain fire down on your village. James and John would have loved that. They were ready to be like, Lord, let's send fireballs to them. They said no to you. Now, the God that we're talking about here and now is a God who will always lay his life down and sacrifice for all. Who's willing to turn his face towards sacrifice and death for the salvation for all people so that we might be made right again with God. And that's the good news of the gospel. And that's the launching point for all of us who follow Jesus. Jesus didn't ask us to do anything we're not the ones who have to move first. We're not the ones who are going to fix the messiness of the world. We do nothing, and Jesus does everything. So Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem. He sets his face toward the cross. He set his face toward the sacrifice that would ultimately allow broken people like us to be reconciled and have a relationship and be forgiven by God so that we might know life. This is what he does when he sets his face toward Jerusalem. In chapter 9, dying on the cross for the salvation of all. Before asking anyone else to take up their own cross, before calling upon any of his friends or any of us to submit anything about our lives, Jesus moves first. Jesus sacrificed first and asks us to do nothing. But what comes next in Luke's gospel is this amazing invitation this, this heartfelt, this, this great desire, this, this really difficult invitation for people like us to take up our own cross, to embrace a life of sacrifice for the sake of others, for the sake of growing the kingdom on earth. What's about to come next in Luke's gospel is not an invitation for you just to do certain things to earn God's favor or salvation. It's not like if you just do this, then you get to be in the club. In the next section of Luke's Gospel, Jesus lays out the cost of following him with three separate examples. This gift of salvation is free, just like what we talked about last week. We do nothing. Jesus does everything, gives us grace, gives us abundant life. But what comes next is an invitation to truly experience a life free from the burdens of the world. What comes next is Jesus' invitation for us to experience what discipleship looks like, what life was designed to look like. Just as intentional as Jesus turns his face to the cross, Jesus invites his followers to be intentional about pursuing his will in all things as a first and foremost priority. So we're going to meet three new people, three different people, with the knowledge of what Jesus is doing and what Jesus has done and seeing how it, it's going to challenge their sense of what it meant to follow Jesus, I want you to read what happens next. And I want you to see yourself in, in, in some way. Because the three examples, the three people that Jesus is going to run into, we fit right into. So we're going to jump back into the text starting in verse 
57. So he's just told them that he's turning his face toward the cross. And now you should, should think, we're on the journey, right? And they were going along the road. Someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, speaking to his heart, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, if you turn your face to the cross too, but you're worried about other things, if you have other priorities, you're not going to get it. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, he has nowhere to lay his head. If you are looking for a comfortable life, if it's comfort that you seek, you're not going to like following me. You'd have a more comfortable life if you hung out with the foxes. You'd have a more comfortable life if you hung out with the birds, because at least they had homes. Get this. This man is a wandering, roving, homeless rabbi. Like, not something that you want your kids to aspire to be. If you're after comfort, Jesus is saying, watch out. Following me is not going to result in a comfortable life. If you follow Jesus, if you reach into the gospel message, there is nothing about the gospel that's comfortable. If anything, it speaks to the discomfort of your own self for the sake of others. And I'd be remiss if I didn't speak into the season we find ourselves in the church when I see this text. Maybe, maybe this, this kingdom perspective speaking to us right here and right now. Because from my, from my perspective, and I, I'm totally okay with being wrong, but I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people. And the church in North America, I think, gets caught up in this. Or if we just get comfortable, if we just we, we design a space, if we, just, if we just do the right things, if we have the right programs, then we, can, then we can finally do church. If we just get comfortable, then we can actually start doing stuff. And what Jesus is saying here is, it's not about comfort people. And since we joined the River team, I've been open about this. And I've seen God move in crazy ways because there's been a feeling in the air in our prayers and our leadership teams that we don't want to just be a church that is comfortable. We don't want to be a church that just, just goes on, you hear a message, you get to go home, you do your own thing. We don't want to be a church that doesn't practice what we preach. We don't want to create a place for people to be comfortable. And I know that's like uncomfortable to hear because like that's what the church is supposed to be. Like, this is a place where you're supposed to have, sit down, you're supposed to have a cup of coffee, you're supposed to get what you need, and then you can go home, right? And I, and don't, don't get me wrong. Like, if you walk through those doors for the very first time today, or if you walk through those doors and you're like, I need some place to feel comfortable, I need a seat to sit down in, I just need to have a cup of coffee, that's what it's for. That's why we have people, like, wanting to give that experience to as many people as we can. But don't miss this. In this one little verse, I'm, I'm convicted. In this one verse, Jesus isn't saying, like, the church is supposed to be a landing spot. That's not what that says. If anything, the church is supposed to be a launching pad. And if we don't see that, if we just say, like, we're just going to sit and we're just going to enjoy our coffee and we're just going to experience a, a Sunday gathering where we can, we can sit and we can put our feet up and we sing a couple songs and then we get to go home and do our own thing, that's not what the church is designed to do. The gospel isn't comfortable, people. <laughs> and Jesus says it. If you want comfort, go hang out with the foxes. If you want comfort, go hang out with the birds. If you want comfort, you're not going to want to hang out with me. Church, this speaks to our heart. This is the heart of God speaking to the heart of the church right here. Or maybe it's your own life where you're just like, I just want to do my own thing. I, like, I want to get comfortable in my faith, and then like, I will decide how I grow, right? That's not what Jesus is saying either. You hear it coming up. This is what he says. This is the next person he, he meets. Jesus says to him, verse 59, follow me. 
He's talking to a new guy. But this guy says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Whew. Jesus isn't being very nice here. He's not being very sympathetic. Aren't you supposed to, Jesus, honor your father and your mother so like you would probably want to bury your own father? Wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? He says, leave your dead dad behind. Let the dead bury their own dead. And as long as I can remember, I, I would read this verse and I go, that just doesn't make sense. So I spent a little bit of time working through this this week. Like, I thought it was weird. Does this guy just show up after his dad would have died? Like, that would make sense given the context, right? Then I looked at it and, and they were like, oh, that would kind of be strange. Because, like, if his dad literally just died, if he hasn't buried him yet, if there hasn't been a funeral yet, like, he would be seen as ceremoniously unclean. And if he was a good Jewish man, he wouldn't come out in public. That's just how it would work. So probably, again, the context, given the context, we don't 100% know, but probably his dad just didn't die, okay? So the second scenario, maybe his dad is going to die soon, right? If this is the case, then what he's doing is he's saying, L listen, Jesus, my dad's going to die soon. As soon as he does, I'm on board. I'm ready to jump on board with you, right? If this is the case, he's just asking for a short delay in his time in following Jesus, right? Who knows how long his dad has left. He's just asking for a short delay before he jumps all in with Jesus. Commentators say that this, this guy is really saying to Jesus, someday, someday, I'll be ready to follow you. Someday. That day is not today. Like, I gotta worry about my dad dying. Maybe tomorrow, or maybe next month, or maybe next year, but just not today. Someday I will be ready to follow you, but I got some stuff coming up that I have to take care of before I get to following you. I need to bury my dad. I need my inheritance money from my dad, because that is how the culture was set up, right? As soon as your, your family, so a member of your family dies, your dad dies, you get the inheritance money, right? So he could be saying, just let me, let my dad die, and then I'll have my inheritance, and then I'll have, be financially secure, and then maybe, maybe someday I'll, re I'll be ready to follow you. I just need to get some stuff squared away. I like what you're saying. I like what you're doing. I like the feeling of it I get from being around you, but I'm just not at the point in my life where I can follow you with everything in my life, or at least most parts of my life, or maybe with just half of my life, or maybe just a single part of my life. I'm not just ready, but someday I will be. I'm not saying any of you are like terrible, sinful people, but if you've ever like spent time betting anything, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about hedging your bets. Like you're sitting on the fence, you're like, I'm going to bet this side, I'm going to bet this side, and I'm going to win, right? And that's what this guy's doing. Like, I'm not ready for you someday, but don't forget about me, Jesus. I'm going to be ready one day. I'm not talking about any of us, right? None of you have put Jesus on the back burner in your life, right? You haven't said to Jesus, like, just let me get through this one season and then I'll be ready to follow you. I just have to look ahead to what is coming up on my plate and like just hold up, like I'm, the, I'm, I'm gonna be ready for you, Jesus, someday. None of us have ever said that, right? For me, a couple seasons of my life, but college was a big time in my life where I was just like, Lord, like listen, I will go to church every Sunday. I will sing in the church choir every Sunday, but guess what, like I just need four years to not have to deal with you. I'd go to parties, right? I'd be like, hey, I gotta go to church tomorrow. And people would be like, oh, that's really good for you. And I'm like, look how righteous I am. But really, I was just like, you stay over there, Jesus. Like, I don't, want, I don't want you interacting with what I got over here. I'm having fun. We don't do that, right? We don't say, Jesus, you stay there. And when I'm ready for you, I'm in. But Jesus says, if you're gonna follow me, don't worry about what comes next. Don't worry about what is in front of you. Let the dead bury their own dead. 
Let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. I don't know if he's just talking about physical death or maybe he's referencing earthly pursuits that, that will not give life and that will ultimately result in death. So Jesus is saying, if your number one priority is not following me, whatever that priority is, it's probably a dead pursuit. Let dead people do dead people things. Every other pursuit in this world leads to death. If you follow me, though, if you pursue me first, you will experience life. You will experience life as God has always designed it to be. If you follow me, Jesus says, neither comfort nor your future pursuits can be your priorities. But wait, there's another person that comes into the story, verse 61. I will follow you, Lord. But first, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Now, this is not a crazy thing for us to think about, right? You'll want to say goodbye to your family, goodbye to your friends. If you're going to go on this journey, you want to say like, hey, just give me a second to go say bye to them. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. You should know by now when you hear something like, but first... When it comes to us talking to Jesus, you should know that there's probably something in the way of us following Jesus, right? I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now this guy, he's not willing to let go of his past. Again, this isn't a crazy request. But this guy just... Like, Jesus hits right to his heart. He gets right to the motive behind what he's saying. I'm not a farmer. I come from the suburbs, and I'm probably going to butcher some part of this, but I just wanted to reference, because Jesus is talking about farming here, and I, like, I, guess I try to look it up, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. You can tell me I'm wrong later. But this is what I, this is what I read what's saying. Back in the first century, if farmers needed to plow their fields, they would have had some sort of tool pulled behind an oxen, right? A handheld tool or something that they would guide, right? And as the oxen would pull the plow, the farmer would walk behind it and steering it. And if you, but if you weren't paying attention, what would happen? You dump it, right? If you look backward, you dump it. Or you go into rocks, or you go into a lake, whatever. If you weren't paying attention, you dump it. I don't, is that, is that right? Is that close? Is it close? Sorry, I, again, I come from the suburbs, unapologetically coming from the suburbs, that's just who we are. If you have a job to do, if, this is what I can understand, if you have a job to do, you got to stay forward on that job, right? If you turn around, what's going to happen? If you're driving a car, pick up your phone, swerving off the road, Right? You know what I'm talking about. That's what Jesus is referencing here. So Jesus is saying, if you're not focused on where you're going, if you're too worried about what's behind you, you're going to get lost when you start following me. Even though this guy says to Jesus, I'm ready to follow you. You hear him, but first, I'm not ready to submit everything to you. I want to follow you, but there are some things in my life that I'm not willing to give up in my life to follow you. We're not like that either, are we? We don't have good times, good, the good old days of our lives. We don't have certain things that we, like, we just can't give up in our lives, right? We don't ever look back when we should be looking forward, right? I, I, th- I think it's interesting for me this week, this like speaks to me, you know, because we're getting ready to transition. And like, I feel that so much of what we're trying to do is arrange all of these things in order. Be like, this has to happen first, and then this has, has to happen, and then we have to buy this, and then we have to go here, and then we have to do this, and all of it's in my, in my list of stuff to do. And I'm just writing down furiously. I'm like, Sarah, look at this, and, and Rachel, look at that, and, and, and I'm like, Ed, take, take a look at this bus idea. And, and, and I'm like, Lord, I just gotta, I gotta take care of this stuff first. I, I just gotta, 
I gotta make sure that, that all these other things that we're, we, we gotta make sure that happens first, happens, and then we're in. We don't do that, right? We don't say like, oh, I just gotta take care of this, this, um, this thing that's connected to me in my past. We don't do that. But Jesus says to this man, if you keep looking back, you're never going to move forward. We referenced Exodus before. If you remember that story, God worked through Moses to bring the Israelites out of the Egyptian slavery. And he brings them, you know, the Red Sea happens, they go into the wilderness. They don't get to the promised land right away. And that makes them upset. So what do they wish for? They say to Moses, we want to go back to slavery because those were good days. They built it up into their mind as something else, something that like was not real. They would rather have gone back into slavery than pursue what God had for them. Jesus says, if you want to pursue the past, following me is going to be tough for you. If you want to hold on to the things that you have to, to work through to, to eventually get to me, you're going to get lost. Because your mind is not going to be focused on what I'm calling you to do. It's, it's going to be on, on turning your head. The plow is going to get dumped. You're going to go in circles. Jesus makes it clear that his goal is to fulfill the mission of salvation for all people. When he says when Luke says that he turns his face toward Jerusalem, when he turns his face toward the cross, he lays himself down for us. His focus is single-minded here. And he invites us to do the same because life behind Jesus is better than any life that we could imagine or design on our own. And today, just as the three people we met on the road to the cross... We wrestle with similar questions. Do I prioritize my comfort? Do I prioritize my future pursuits? Do I prioritize my, my past desires over Jesus? And that's a tough question. Because on so many days, we do. I do. On so many days, we would rather pursue the ways of the world rather than the ways of Jesus. Because who wants to be broke? Who wants to be homeless? Who wants to be hungry? Who wants to be uncomfortable in this world? Who wants to give it all up? But Jesus says here, if you follow me, if you do this, it will all be worth it. Jesus, in this chapter, with his face clearly turned toward the mission of salvation that he will fulfill on the cross, Jesus says, the comfort you desire is found in me. The treasure you want is found in me. The future that you want is found in me. There's nothing in your past life that will ever compare to the life that you will experience in following me. Church, hear the good news as he turned his face toward the cross. He became uncomfortable so that we might experience true comfort. He gave up his future. He died so that we might have life. He put his hand to the plow, driving it right to the cross so that we might experience abundant life. From here on out, Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. He set his face toward the cross for the salvation for all people. And this is not an easy mission to join in on, but the gospel doesn't promise easy. The gospel promises a life transformed as we work toward experiencing the cross when we follow behind Jesus if we experience comfort and a future and a purpose if we follow Jesus we experience comfort and a future and a purpose that passes all of our understanding church this is the challenge for us to follow him to turn our face toward him, to surrender everything that we have and everything that we are for the sake of bringing the kingdom of God to earth today. Church, I pray that Jesus works in you and molds in you to constantly be turning your eyes, turning your face toward him in all things in your life and in the life of our church. Let's pray. Jesus, there is 
no one like you. There is no one who would be willing to turn towards suffering and pain and death like you. There is no one who's willing, who would be willing to give up comfort, give up what's to come in the future, give up things that have come in the past like you. And while we should fall short of the glory of God in our own pursuits, you continue to call us deeper to experience more of who you are. You call us to turn our faces toward you. You call us to turn our comforts, our future, our past to you. You call us to lay all of those things down. Our burdens, our failures, our everything. You call us to lay all things at your feet. Jesus, I just I pray that you open our eyes and open our hearts to that truth. Mold us daily that we might see more of you in the biggest of things and in the mundane. Convict us to turn our faces toward you so that we might experience who you are and embrace what you have done for each of us. That we might be okay in leaving our comforts. That we might be okay in leaving our future in your hands. That we might be okay in surrendering all the things of our past. Because in you, we, we see that in, in, in dying to ourselves, in dying to the ways of the world, we find life. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we give you praise this day. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.